The bells are chiming outside, so I'll welcome you. Good morning again, and welcome to Concurrent Paper Session 1A, Liturgical Theology and Ecclesiology. We are grateful to our four presenters today, this morning, as well as to our featured respondent, John Baldwin of the Society of Jesus. Father Baldwin is a member of the Society of Jesus and a professor of historical and liturgical theology at the School of Theology and Ministry here at Boston College. He has served on the U.S. Catholic Bishops Advisory Committee on the Liturgy and has been president of the North American Academy of Liturgy, Societas Liturgica, and the Youngman Society for Jesuits and Liturgy. He's the author or editor of many volumes, including most recently, Catholic Sacraments, A Rich Source of Blessing, Commentary on the Order of Mass of the Roman Missal, and Reforming the Liturgy, A Response to the Critics. So welcome, Father Baldwin. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly describe the format for our session. After the four presentations and Father Baldwin's response, we will open to questions from the audience with any remaining time. To ask a question, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen within the reactions uh, tab. If you really don't like public speaking, please write your question in the chat function, which can be sent directly to me, and I'm happy to ask the question on your behalf. So we'll begin today with Deborah Ann Wong of Duke Divinity School. Deborah Ann Wong is a worship leader and scholar interested in the relationship between worship theology and worship practice, with an emphasis on contemporary and charismatic praise and worship. Her research traces the historical development of this form of worship and a with a particular eye towards Southeast Asia. Currently a second year THD student in liturgical studies at Duke Divinity with a minor in Christian education and formation, she seeks to combine the best resources from the church and the academy as a worship scholar for the church and a worship leader in the academy. So we welcome Deborah Ann Wong, who will be presenting her paper, Liturgy in Lockdown, Expanding the Notion of Church. Thanks, Zach. It's good to be with you all today. Um, so as Zach said, my, titles in, my paper is entitled Liturgy in Lockdown. Um, and I don't know if any of you watch uh, Sherlock Holmes, but in season two, episode one of the BBC television adaptation of Sherlock Holmes, which stars the wonderful Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, there's a scene in which we find our detective hero in the living room of his nemesis, Irene Adler, and he's trying to discover the location of a concealed safe. Now, Adler is present, uh, and she and Holmes engage in some classic British, very polite British smack talk, uh, until Holmes employs a really simple trick to uncover the safe's hiding spot. He gets his accomplice, John Watson, to set off the fire alarm, right? As soon as the alarm goes off, Adler's eyes flicker toward the mirror behind which the safe is hidden, thus revealing its location. And Holmes explains, fire exposes our priorities. Our instinct in a fire is to save the thing that we treasure the most. Similarly, in this pandemic that has threatened to destroy the life that we knew, a church's instincts have been to save the thing that they treasure most, to preserve what they consider to be their central mission. And it's that response that I want to examine today. While analyzing the results of a two-part survey of over 1,500 pastors and leaders that was conducted in March and April of last year, Professor Heidi Campbell observed that pastors overwhelmingly ranked conducting weekend services as their priority, whether that meant moving services online or just uh, stubbornly insisting on meeting in person despite regulations and recommendations to the contrary. Their goal, their priority was to keep the Sunday service going. Uh, Professor Campbell, who studies digital religion and new media, observes that this response reveals what she calls a primarily event-based understanding of religion. And she argues that this, this kind of understanding is out of step with the networked age in which we live, one in which people experience community as a social network of relations, rather than as centered around a single group like the church. In our brief time together today, I want to suggest that this dichotomy between an event-based and a networked approach to religious community is actually a false one, and that the Christian community has in fact always been a networked community with an outward directional telos. So what is needed, I think, is not a decentering of the worship event from church community, like Campbell's comments might suggest, but rather what we need is to reclaim the event more fully as one that is concerned with creating and sustaining a community that is both local and global, 
both situated and dispersed, both gathered and sent. The idea of a network society has been around at least since 1991 with the publication of Jan van Dyck's book, The Network Society. Uh, and it's only increased in popularity with what Lee Rainey and Barry Wellman referred to in 2010 as a triple revolution of the internet, social media, and mobile. Among the features of what Rainey and Wellman call this new operating system are a move away from group or institutional identity towards networked, event, uh, networked individualism and a corresponding shifting of authority structures. For example, whereas in the past, people's social networks used to be small and revolve tightly around family and community groups in, in the village, uh, they are now looser and much more expansive like our conference today evidences. Uh, where social relationships were once centered on these tightly knit groups, each individual is now the center of their own social network. And with this shift comes a blurring of authority as traditional hierarchies are diluted by these horizontal connections enabled by the social network. The internet has made information that, once, that was once restricted to those with special expertise and training now available to anyone with a smartphone who can spell Google or Wikipedia. And similarly, local pastors are no longer the only or even the closest spiritual authority to which individuals have access. The shift in structure has been seen by some as a threat to the social fabric of society. Um, in 1970, uh, Robert Putnam identified this shift away from group-based membership as a sign of the collapse of American community, right, in his uh, book, Bowling Alone. Uh, pastors and leaders of churches likewise fear that the declining attendance that they see at church services is a sign of decreased religiosity among its members. The assumption here is that if people aren't attending church, then they're not engaging with or they're not committed to the faith. So in this, in this world, in this approach, uh, participation in the worship event is seen as the marker of one's religiosity and faithfulness, of one's commitment to this religious community. And so as a result, some church leaders have focused their efforts on making church services, uh, what Campbell refers to as the worship event, uh, more engaging so as to increase participation in that event. But meanwhile, a recognition of this network reality that Campbell refers to has led others to adopt a different strategy. Um, instead of trying to bring people to church, they focus on bringing the church to where people already are. Uh, one example is uh, this book, The Digital Cathedral Networked Ministry in a Wireless World by a pastor named Keith Anderson. And in this book, he tells of ministry initiatives that range from theology pub gatherings to Bible studies held in coffee shops to just handing out coffee and donuts on a street corner. Uh, and he cites these as examples of, quote, a networked, relational and incarnational approach to ministry leadership for a digital age, end quote. His vision is for a more expansive understanding of church and ways of being church at a time when our definitions of church have become all too narrow, too parochial, too event-based, we might say. Henderson urges church leaders to step out of the church and to be present in the places where people work and live and play, and to pay attention to the spirituality of everyday life, which he says is distinct from the formal spirituality of the institutional church. Now, Anderson's model expands the religious community beyond the church building by recognizing ordinary places as sacred as well. This model acknowledges the networked relationality according to which the world operates, and it seeks for the church to be present in those networks beyond the church. Um, such an approach creates the space to acknowledge that there are other ways to engage faithfully in religious community outside of participation in the worship event. But this raises a key ecclesiological question. Are these different approaches to sacred space interchangeable? Um, are theology pub gatherings and adequate substitute for participation in the, in the liturgy? Uh, or is there something about the formal liturgical event that still warrants a central place in church's understanding of religious community? Put another way, is it simply enough that we gather or do how we gather and what we do when we gather also make a difference? 
You know, liturgical theologians like Aidan Kavanaugh and David Fagerberg have long insisted that the liturgical gathering is a special kind of gathering. It's distinct from other gatherings that might also be convened in the name of God. Um, they want to emphasize that God is the primary actor in the liturgy, not humans, uh, and that it is in the rites and the rituals of the liturgy that God chooses to reveal God's self to us. As humans, then, we receive and we participate in the liturgy, and through that we are formed and transformed with the capacity to then see God at work in the world more clearly. In addition, the liturgy makes certain demands upon us. Um, in what has come to be understood as the traditional fourfold pattern of gathering, word, table or response, and sending, um, the liturgical event is not self-contained. It doesn't end with us you know, walking out the doors and just leaving because it's over. Rather, we are sent out, we are commissioned to continue the reconciling work of God that we have encountered in the liturgy to continue that work out in the world. And so the very telos of this worship event is the sending forth of participants from the event to be for the world, the body of Christ, as some liturgies put it. So in this way, both event and network, I think, are inextricably bound up together in the liturgical event. Um, this event and what Christians do in it remains central, right? It is the center from, from which we are sent out to be the church. Uh, but we must be careful not to fall prey to what Paul Homer terms a liturgical hyperconsciousness. That is being overly conscious of the liturgy itself when the aim of the liturgy is in fact to make one conscious of God. Such hyperconsciousness results in an inward looking approach that sees the worship event as an end in itself. And if we see it that way, then its telos remains unfulfilled. So what does this all mean for liturgy in the midst of a pandemic and beyond, right? Um, first, I think it affirms the instinct of those pastors and leaders who focused on trying to maintain a worship gathering, those in the survey who said that their priority was to keep this event going. Um, at the same time, however, it reminds us that the goal of these offerings is not simply to reach a certain level of viewership or attendance. Uh, many pastors lament the lower viewership for online services as compared to in-person attendees, fearing that their congregants are no longer engaging in religious community in the church. Um, now, this fear is a valid one, but um, Campbell's critique reminds us that viewership numbers might not be the best metric to focus on, both in terms of accuracy of measuring that participation uh, and of representing the church's actual mission. Anecdotal evidence suggests that while some have indeed stopped going to church altogether and have not engaged in alternative forms of religious activity, Many others have actually found new ways of worshiping through practices of, uh, you know, some have reclaimed these practices of morning and evening prayer. Uh, some have engaged in new liturgies that have been written for the ordinary events of daily life. Uh, and some have engaged in various online religious communities through social media and the internet. And so the conclusion that congregants, <clears throat> excuse me, the congregants who are not attending services online have forsaken worship practices altogether may not be entirely true. Now, in cases where it is true, and undoubtedly there are some of those cases, I think what all this teaches us is that what should trouble pastors the most is not the fact that these congregants are no longer attending church, but rather that their previous participation in the worship event has somehow failed to form them to be a people whose worship continues beyond and in the absence of the worship event. Right? A crucial question that the pandemic leads church leaders to ask, I think, is how do we help our parishioners understand the mission with which they are sent forth from this worship event into the world, especially in a time when the world in which they are sent forth into which they're sent forth is one largely confined to the walls of their home. Um, how is the way that churches conduct the liturgy forming or failing to form in parishioners this capacity to see in every place, every person, every ordinary day, the possibility of encounter with the living God? What resources are we providing or failing to provide them with in order to develop this capacity in them? 
In this time of pandemic and isolation, when many churches continue to gather online, I think the cry is very much for community and for communion with others. And in light of that, it might seem like this call to emphasize the sending forth from the event as equally important to the gathering together is somewhat misplaced. Um, and yet, I think an event-based approach to religious community that focuses on the gathering to the exclusion of the sending positions the liturgical event as the be-all and end-all of Christian worship and discipleship. It restricts liturgy and worship and formation to the event as though the liturgy itself is in lockdown, restricted from leaving the walls of the worship hall or the sanctuary. And such an approach, I think, naturally results in the kind of liturgical hyperconsciousness that Paul Homer mentions. It directs worship planners to focus all their energies on ensuring that the event itself runs smoothly, that the event is attractive, and you know, bringing as many people as possible to the event. Uh, and it can leave participants with the impression that God is only to be encountered here in this worship event. So I've suggested instead that the worship event properly conceived is designed to point worshipers beyond itself, that the directionality of its telos is outward into the world, so that having encountered Christ, uh, you know, Christ's disciples were sent into the world with the promise that Jesus would be with them always. And so rather than keeping worshipers captive to itself, uh, the liturgy, by facilitating an encounter with the risen Christ, I think similarly sends us forth into the world with the promise of Christ's presence and with the ability and the freedom to discern Christ's work, to discern the light of Christ and the work of the Spirit more fully in the world. This enables us as worshipers to both appreciate and participate in the sacramentality of ordinary everyday life. And in this regard, Although the pandemic has shaken the foundations of church's worship life in many ways, I think Christian communities can receive it not only as a restriction on their worship, but in fact as an invitation to a more expansive vision of worship that begins in the event, but continues far beyond it. One that invites us to encounter God everywhere, even in the midst of a global pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. We'll turn now to our second uh, presenter, Edmund Lazzari. Edmund is a PhD student in systematic theology and theological ethics at Marquette University and adjunct professor of philosophy at Prince George's Community College. His articles in liturgical, systematic, medieval, and speculative theology have appeared in journals such as Antiphon and New Black Friars Review. He is the author of Why Nature Matters, Unlocking Catholic Doctrine Through Common Sense Philosophy, forthcoming from New Priory Press. So we welcome Edmund in his presentation of the paper, Virtual Catholicism, an Anthropological and Sacramental Critique. All right, thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to, to start this reflection on uh, a paper that will be largely about the sacraments of the Catholic Church. Uh, with an overview of a couple of concepts that we may not be familiar with. So there are three sacraments at the core of the supernatural life of the Catholic. Baptism infuses the Catholic with supernatural life and unites her to God. Confession restores her to this union after being separated from God in deliberate mortal sin. The Eucharist, quote, the source and summit, end quote, of the supernatural life, consummates this union with God on earth and is a foretaste of perfection in heaven. A particular interest in a time of pandemic, the graces of these sacraments are all available in principle without the physical presence of the Catholic at the sacrament. Only under extreme circumstances, of course, but the Council of Trent taught that the desire for baptism, the desire for confession coupled with perfect contrition, and the desire for Eucharistic communion can suffice to receive these spiritual benefits from these sacraments. The age of pandemic seems to merit extreme circumstances, especially when the sacraments are unavailable to Catholics because of health codes restricting gatherings, for instance, as happened in March and April of 2020. Granting for the sake of argument that lay Catholics were aware of the desire for these sacraments, aware that the desire for these sacraments can grant these graces, and that they were well disposed to do so, not trivial assumptions. 
is there anything wrong with this arrangement? This arrangement of receiving graces at a distance. An act of spiritual communion at home while watching a live streamed mass could conceivably impart grace. An act of perfect contrition and a desire for confession would forgive sins apart from the confessional. A desire for baptism coupled with the intention to undergo baptism when possible could unite one to Christ. It seems that all that is necessary for salvation can be done in crisis without physical access to the sacraments. My next section is virtual Catholicism and flourishing. This picture, however, misses a major distinction in Catholic theology. In the moral anthropology of the Catholic tradition, there are two general standards for morality. The first is the minimum of avoiding sin, whereas the second is the further goal of the flourishing of the Christian in Christ. Mere rule following belongs chiefly to to the novice who is learning the fundamental conditions necessary for a life of true in Christ. While adopting virtuous habits and the overall dispositions towards the moral life expounded in the Beatitudes belong to moral maturity. This distinction between the minimum necessary and what is necessary to flourish is applicable in other areas of Catholic theology as well, such as in liturgical and sacramental theology. Particular extraordinary circumstances could and at times should, call for exceptional accommodations that respect what is necessary to the sacramental or moral situation. When these accommodations or exceptions are made, however, the goal of flourishing is not destroyed, but rather recognize that it cannot be met in such circumstances. In the liturgical and sacramental economy, the biggest difference between what is necessary in a crisis and what is necessary for flourishing is the embodied communal aspects of human life. These stem from both the constitution of the human being and the Lord's choices in establishing the sacraments as the means of salvation. The virtual in virtual Catholicism can be understood in two ways. First, virtual can be taken in the common sense way of happening through digital technology. The second meaning, however, derives from the Latin virtute, meaning by power. A virtual Catholicism in the second sense would refer to the action of God to infuse the graces of baptism, confession, and the Eucharist in the lay Catholic by power, based on the desire for the sacrament, rather than in the sacramental bodily and communal ways established by Jesus Christ. In both senses, a virtual Catholicism drastically falls short of a flourishing sacramental and liturgical life. The remainder of this paper will show how virtual Catholicism fails to account for the embodied and social constitution of the human being in the order of nature, as well as in the sacramental economy built upon the order of nature by Jesus Christ. My next section is embodiedness and the sociality of the human condition. To be embodied is a constitutive aspect of the human person. We interact with the world through our bodies, in a metaphor from Cartesian graphing, Edmund Husserl called the body, quote, the zero point, end quote. That is the center to which all of our experience is compared and indexed. In the words of Robert Sokolowski, quote, my own body is always an inescapable here for perception, action, and speech. Even when we speak over a cell phone and when I and my interlocutor are far removed from one another, I highlight the point where I am located and from which I intervene in the world, whether by emotion, action, or speech." End quote. The second creation story in Genesis, by stretch, stressing humanity's creation from the clay of the ground, sets forth the body as an indispensable constitutive aspect of the human person. I only exist, experience, and act in the world in and through my body. The traditional five senses of seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling are all profound dimensions of our bodiliness. Our senses and our perception are the means by which we interact with the world. We know not only ourselves through our awareness of our bodies, but we also know the world through our interaction with the objects of our senses. All of our experience is rooted in bodily senses by which we discover the world beyond ourselves and upon which we reflect in thought and self-awareness. The body is not just essential for the individual constitution of the human being, 
but its very ability to be sensed allows it to be a privileged locus for interpersonal communion. Sokolowski once more states the role of the body thus, quote, we do not know just the mind of another. We have the body given first, but the body is given as a place in which the consciousness of the other holds sway. That body, furthermore, does not just provide the place for the other consciousness and a location for the other point of view. It also expresses the mind of the other. The spoken language, the intentional gestures, and the indeliberate body language are all more than just bodily motions. They signal intentional acts. And they also express a content of thought, end quote. Our interpersonal interactions with each other are also through the body. Our knowledge of each other is through the body in some way, even if it is merely the effects caused through the body. Aristotle considered the unique gift of human speech evidence that human beings were profoundly associative, social, and interpersonal animals. This most interpersonal gift of speech is expressed through the vocal cords and mouth and received by the eardrums. It is expressed and received bodily. John Paul II's writing on the constitution of human beings in the original solitude of the garden, bestowed with subjectivity alone among the animals, highlights simultaneously humanity's place in creation, quote, precisely as a body among bodies, end quote, and the connection of, quote, man's original solitude with the awareness of the body, end quote. This embodiedness in solitude yearns for the twofold fulfillment of human communion. Firstly, an interpersonal relationship with God, and then the communion of the sexual difference. Though, quote, the fact that man is a body belongs more deeply to the structure of the personal subject than the fact that in his somatic constitution he is also male and female, end quote, both embodiedness and interpersonal communion in the sexual difference are fundamental and constitutive aspects of humanity. While there are certainly aspects of the internal lives of human beings which are not shared, the bodily constitution of human beings belong decidedly to the social sphere as well as the person. My next section is virtual Catholicism and the human constitution. While virtual meetings and events do allow for some forms of interpersonal and social relationship, they drastically cut down on the aspects of the experience that are directly embodied. This can be seen most clearly through the curtailing of the senses in a virtual liturgy. In a normal Sunday mass that chooses to use all of the normal solemnity recommended by the general instruction of the Roman Missal, all five traditional senses are engaged. We not only see the celebrant and his vestments, but we see all the other members of the congregation. We can look around the church building and see the sacred art that teaches us about what the faith is. We hear not only the words of the liturgy, but also the beautiful liturgical music, which Sacrosanctum Concilium called, quote, preeminent above all other liturgical arts, end quote. And the responses of the entire congregation with us. We hear the scuffles of children, the creak of wooden pews, and the bells of the consecration. We smell the incense, the air of the church, and perhaps the odor of other people near us. We feel not just other congregants of the sign of peace, but the pews, kneelers, and the bottoms of our feet as we conform ourselves to the gestures of liturgical prayer. The taste of the Eucharist crowns this experience of the senses at Mass. A virtual liturgy immediately restricts the senses to two, seeing and hearing. Hearing is restricted not only to what can be rendered from whatever microphone the parish has available and whatever speakers the congregant uses, but the congregant does not hear her voice added to the responses or to the music. But for the act of spiritual communion and the prayers of the congregant, she will be reduced to the role of a mere observer rather than a participant of the liturgy. Physically occupying the space is certainly not sufficient in itself for an experience of liturgical community. But the elimination of the essential aspects of the liturgy severely hampers the union of anthropological and spiritual dimensions of the human being normally promoted by the solemn celebration of the liturgy. On the anthropological and phenomenal levels, therefore, the restriction of liturgies to merely digital streams 
even those that would permit auditory feedback from digital participants, reduces the phenomenological experience from participating with one's body to experiencing a distant effect caused by a body. While this distance is precisely what is intended in protecting bodily health, the diminishing of bodily worship and communion is to that extent a diminishing of the human aspect of the liturgy. Embodiness and sacramentality in the order of grace. In the supernatural order, this revelation of the invisible through the physical is even more important than in the anthropological considerations above. Because, as St. Thomas Aquinas famously, famously said, quote, grace does not destroy nature but perfects it, end quote, God's actions in creation, salvation history, and most strikingly in the incarnation have established the sacramental order, elevating the anthropological constitution of human beings to union with the second person of the Trinity. Not only do, quote, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork, end quote, but the liturgies of the old covenant use material signs to recall God's mighty deeds and to prefigure the ministry of Christ. The incarnation itself is a sacrament because the Lord chose a visible embodied human nature as his instrument of supreme self-disclosure to humanity. In his earthly ministry, Jesus Christ used many physical actions and signs in touching those who were unclean, by writing on the ground, by mixing his spit with dirt and laying on the eyes of the blind, by shedding his blood for our salvation. In establishing the seven sacraments of the new law, Jesus Christ continued this pattern of using the physical and bodily signs to reveal and impart grace through oil, water, and the forms of bread and wine. Not only was the embodied physicality of human nature incorporated into the sacraments, but the social nature of human beings was also incorporated. While Jesus Christ could have established the means of salvation to be individualistic and at a distance from other human beings, he called apostles together, endowed them with the authority to confer the sacraments, and promised to gather all people into one in him through the apostles. The Acts of the Apostles constantly testifies to the bodily and social necessities of Christian discipleship. New Christians are incorporated into the community wherein all pray and share goods in common in Acts 2.44 and 3, uh, 4.32. Even the term incorporation reflects the truth that the baptized are members of the corporate mystical body of Christ and are thus interconnected with all believers. Apostolic succession and the laying on of hands is done not only for individuals, but by the head of the Christian community for the entire Christian community. The church itself as assembly is an intrinsically social being, not merely because of the necessity of the anthropological, but because the Lord established it to be a community through which sanctifying grace would be imparted. The order of grace also shows forth the communal and intersubjective nature of Christian eschatology. Salvation is made possible not only through the bodily sacraments and the supernatural community of the church, but the final state of the saved is also communal and liturgical. In the words of John Paul II, the total gift of self in seeing God in the beatific vision, quote, will above all be man's rediscovery of himself, not only in the depth of his own person, but also in that union which is proper to the world of persons in their psychosomatic constitution. We should think of the reality of the other world in the categories of a rediscovery of a new perfect subjectivity of each person, and at the same time a rediscovery of a new perfect intersubjectivity of all. In this way, the, in this, way this reality means the true and definitive fulfillment of human subjectivity. And on this basis, the definitive fulfillment of the spousal meaning of the body, end quote. Through being one with the Trinitarian communion of persons, the Christian will enter into a communion with all other human beings in their full intersubjectivity and their psychosomatic constitution, not merely of their soul. This communion, while virginal, will also be the fulfillment of the spousal meaning of the body, and so the bodily aspect of our final end cannot be set aside. Our liturgy here below foreshadows this divine and intersubjective communion, so much so that the book of Revelation uses the liturgy as the chief image of the heavenly life. While earthly liturgy is not as bodily as the heavenly one will be, 
the disembodying of the liturgy through digital means cannot serve the same foreshadowing role as in-person liturgies. While less than in heaven, the bodily elements of the liturgy are not negligible either on the objective or subjective levels. The subjective experience of the liturgy and the objective involvement of the body in the liturgy both reflect the psychosomatic constitution involved in the eschatological vision. The earthly liturgy fails to live up to his symbolism of the heavenly life precisely insofar as it diminishes either the bodily or spiritual participation in the liturgy. Now my conclusion. So long as the will of those assisting at a digital liturgy is properly disposed to the liturgy, the Lord can use the desire of the soul for the sacrament to impart grace. In situations such as our contemporary global pandemic, if there is no reliably safe way to gather in person, such means can be prudent and spiritually efficacious channels of grace. As a more permanent solution, however, such liturgies would use the soul and effectively abandon the body in the process of salvation, directly counter to both the anthropological order and the sacramental order established by God. Digital liturgies can, at best, adequately engage only the soul, which, though important, is not enough for the flourishing of the psychosomatically constituted communal human being in the patterns established by Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edmund. We appreciate that. Our next presenter is Dominic Pinieri from the Catholic University of America. He is currently a PhD candidate in systematic theology at CUA and is writing his dissertation about the significance of the incarnation in the theology of Raymond Schwager. It's my pleasure to introduce Dominic, who will be presenting his paper, Is the Laity Non-Essential? Clericalism and Mass Suspension for COVID-19. Dominic. Thank you very much, Zach. Lumen Gentium, the Catholic Church's dogmatic constitution concerning its teaching about what the church is, describes the Eucharist as the source and summit of Christian life. Under normal circumstances, every Catholic is obligated to attend Mass each Sunday, but with the complications brought about with the COVID-19 pandemic, this normal obligation was suspended. Starting in March 2020, for several months, bishops across the world canceled public mass, leaving many Catholics feeling that something important was missing from their lives. On March 17, 2020, Bishop Jaime Soto of the Diocese of Sacramento issued this statement as part of a decree. With a heavy heart, conscious of accelerating rates of coronavirus infection, also known as COVID-19, I'm suspending the public celebration of Sunday and weekday masses for the Diocese of Sacramento in California until further notice. This pastoral directive cooperates with the increased public health precautions issued by local, state, and federal officials in order to protect vulnerable populations from contact with the coronavirus. Similarly, Bishop Michael Burbage of the Diocese of Arlington in Virginia released a statement on the same day saying, Therefore, it is with great sadness that I announce beginning March 17th, I am suspending the public celebration of all masses in the Diocese of Arlington until further notice. Suspending masses may safeguard our physical health, but I understand that our spiritual health must also be maintained to the best of our ability. This cancellation of public mass continued through Easter and into the summer. Few bishops, however, attempted a form of outdoor mass. Bishop Jerome Listecki of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee allowed mass to be celebrated on Easter in parking lots. However, he quickly banned this practice saying, parking lot masses are not possible if we want to maintain our priorities of keeping people safe, including ourselves and our staff, preserving the dignity of the Eucharist and sustaining unity among ourselves as ministers and leaders. Given that we are a sacramental church, a Eucharistic people, parking lot masses should not be celebrated mainly because the distribution of the Eucharist cannot be done in a consistent and safe, dignified manner. The response of lay Catholics have been mixed. Many approve of the safety practicing of canceling mass, but some have expressed concern about it. In response to this statement of Milwaukee's Archbishop, Catholic journalist Bill Lawler argued that mass could be said safely in parking lots without the distribution of the Eucharist, and this would be better than no mass at all. Physician John Safranic wrote about the suspension of public mass as being a denial of something that is necessary. He noticed that in the hospital where he worked, they were taking precautions to operate as safely as possible, 
but bishops chose to simply forego the public mass. Not feeling that this falls in line with his Catholic beliefs, he writes, my spiritual life is the most important aspect of my being, and the Eucharist is the source and summit of my faith. Yet it was deemed less essential than daycare, and few bishops demurred. Beyond daycare, many arguably less essential public institutions remained open, such as liquor stores. Furthermore, it is important to see that the bishops were not canceling mass as a whole. Masses were still being celebrated by priests, but the laity were not allowed to attend, denying lay members access to the church and this important ritual. Dr. Safranik puts it well saying, the bishop's solution to the coronavirus was private masses by the priests and internet streaming for everyone else. But this gives rise to clericalism. Isn't the call to holiness universal and confusion? Clericalism refers to giving spiritual superiority to the clergy, treating the laity as being of lesser value in a Catholic view. Essentially, one could interpret the action of the bishops as meaning that lay participation in the mass and in the Eucharist is not an essential aspect of the life of the church. Could this be true? In order to come to a conclusion about whether or not barring the laity from mass is consistent with church theology, we will briefly examine Lumen Gentium, Vatican II's dogmatic constitution on the church. By looking at this crucial and recent document, we will analyze the church's foundational beliefs concerning mass and the laity. From this, we will be able to accurately evaluate whether or not the suspension of public mass is synchronous with Catholic teaching. Firstly, it should be pointed out that Vatican II brought about significant change in the way that the church understood the laity. The distinction between the clergy and the laity had grown so vast in the era before the council that the church was becoming established almost exclusively around the clergy who were the only ones authorized to carry out the church's mission. And on the other hand, the laity were being attributed a degree of secularization in their functions that almost placed them outside of the church. Vatican II worked to undo this and emphasize the unity of the church and its singular mission while maintaining a real distinction in the roles of the clergy and the laity. Lumen Gentium says, all the faithful, that is who by baptism are incorporated into Christ are constituted the people of God who have been made sharers in their own way in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly office of Christ and play their part in carrying out the mission of the whole Christian people in the church and in the world. Ferdinand Klostermann's commentary on the chapter of the document describes that it teaches the contribution of laymen to the welfare of the entire church is the common task of all Christians to proclaim the truth of the good news, to concern themselves with the growth and building up of the whole body of Christ and thus ensure together that the total cosmic goal is attained, which Christ has in a view in building up his body, which is the church. The church's only purpose is to work for the salvation of the world through Jesus Christ. All people are called to this mission equally. But this does not mean that the clergy and the laity do not have specific roles within the one mission of the church. It would be helpful for us to look at how the church sees the importance of the role of the laity. But in doing this, it is important to keep in mind that the distinction of these roles does not separate the clergy from the laity. Instead, it unites them, as Lumen Gentium says, this very diversity of graces, of ministries and works gather the children of God into one. For all these things are the work of the one in the same spirit. The document specifically expounds on the ecclesiastic role of the laity. It reads, the laity, however, are given this special vocation to make the church present and fruitful in those places and circumstances where it is only through them that it can become the salt of the earth. This describes that the laity whose life takes them within the secular sphere are to make the church present there. This is only possible because the church is present in the laity, not only in the clergy. Furthermore, the role of the laity is not only to be manifested in secular situations. The laity have a role to play within the liturgical life of the church. Lumen Gentium declares, to the laity whom Christ intimately joins to his life and mission, he also gives a share in his priestly office of offering spiritual worship for the glory of the Father and the salvation of humanity. The church has always taught that through baptism and confirmation, all Christians are partakers in Christ's threefold office of priest, prophet, and king. But Vatican II emphasizes the priesthood of the laity with greater clarity, force, and authority than ever before. 
the role of the laity is not only found in the secular sphere, but in the ecclesial. Lumen Gentium further explains, in the celebration of the Eucharist, the prayers and apostolic undertakings are offered to the Father in all piety along with the body of the Lord. And so worshiping everywhere by their holy actions, the laity consecrate the world, uh, the world itself to God. But Lumen Gentium speaks of the Eucharist with even more profound significance. It reads in the second chapter containing teaching about all members of the church. Taking part in the Eucharistic sacrifice, the source and summit of Christian life, the faithful offer the divine victim to God and themselves along with him. And so it is that both in the offering and in Holy Communion in their separate ways, though not of course indiscriminately, all have their own part to play in the liturgical action. Then strengthened by the body of Christ in the Eucharistic communion, they manifest in a concrete way that unity of the people of God, which this most holy sacrament aptly signifies and admirably realizes. We can see that the Eucharist and the Mass is not something that the laity only receives passively or even is involved in marginally. Furthermore, the Eucharist is the unifying factor within the church in which all members actively participate in order to accomplish the singular mission of the church. Both the mission and unity of the church are based in Christ himself who is present as the Eucharist and in the church as his body. Towards the end of Lumen Gentium's chapter on the laity, the council fathers make explicit the laity's rights as members of the body of Christ, saying, like all the faithful, the laity have the right to receive abundant help from their pastors out of the church's spiritual treasury, especially the word of God and the sacraments. Here we see the sincerity of the theological beliefs described in the writings of the council. The mass, among other things, is foundational for the Christian life in such a way that the laity possesses a right to it as members of God's church. From these statements, we can confidently assess that the importance of mass in the life of the church. We have seen that the laity possesses an essential role in the church without which the church cannot fully work towards the completion of its mission. The church has only one mission, which is shared by the clergy and the laity as equal members of the body of Christ. This means that there is a mutual interdependence of the members of the church. The laity need the clergy and vice versa because we are one body. As a glorious gift to achieve and strengthen this unity, which is based in the one Lord, Christ gave himself in the Eucharist. The Eucharist and the sacrifice of the mass unite all the body of Christ in a profound and fundamental way. The overall vision of the church, which Vatican II gives, is one of unity, a unity in the one Christ. We are to act together even when we act in our specific roles. This is done especially in the Eucharist. What does this mean with regard to the current pandemic, particularly looking at the suspension of public mass? The teaching of the Second Vatican Council makes such an action dubious. The decision of the bishops to suspend obligation for the laity to attend mass is understandable. But what goes too far is barring the laity from the mass by suspending its public celebration. While it is true that some laity live in remote or largely non-Catholic places where mass is inaccessible due to a shortage of priests, most Catholics find themselves in a different situation. The priests were at their local parishes saying mass, but the laity were not allowed in the building. They could not participate. They could not liturgically practice their priesthood. They could not consecrate the world to God through the mass, a world which is in so much need. Because of this, the church was not fully working towards its mission. While God's graces are not limited to the sacraments, we must remember the significance of the mass as we move into the future. We are not through this current pandemic. Public mass may be suspended again. More pandemics are sure to come. It is hard to say what the right course of action will be, but it would seem for the current pandemic, suspending public mass was too great a caution because it took away from the laity the source and summit of their lives in an environment which left many lesser institutions running due to their essentialness. We saw in the statements examined by the bishops at the beginning of this paper, suspending public mass was done to comply with civil law and safeguard physical safety. After these considerations, seems that the spiritual priorities were thought of only as secondary. 
Must we live first, then be Christian? The tradition of the church usually teaches it the other way around. We must die first, then be Christians. We must always remember Christ's mission to give not only life, but life to the fullest. Bishops should have tried to increase safety while prioritizing our Christian welfare. The choice of either mass as usual or no public mass is only a false dichotomy. There could have been more planning to make parking lot masses work or more precautions during mass, such as more social distancing. We must take the mindset that mass is essential, including for the laity, and therefore ask ourselves, how can we make it happen safely? We must not be afraid to live and testify that our first priority is to be Christian. This is how we consecrate the whole world, ecclesial and secular, to God who loved us so much that he walked through mud and rain, bled and died, rose and ascended with no other mission than the salvation of the entire world. In conclusion, it is clear from Lumen Gentium that the laity have a role to play within the mission of the church, which is not secondary to that of the clergy. The fruition of the laity's role is lived out in and nourished by the Eucharist. Mass can only be taken away to the detriment of the entire church. This is what was done last year when bishops forbade the public from attending Mass and receiving the Eucharist. The source and summit of our lives is Christian, and without Christ, there is no life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominic. Our final presenter this, this morning is Tyler J. Fuller. Tyler is a PhD student at Boston University in the graduate program in religion, specializing in religion and philosophy, politics, and society. Tyler is training as a sociocultural scholar of religion and public health, and his research interests focus on lived religion, narrative, and collective memory in relation to health-seeking behaviors and faith-based health education. Tyler received his MTS and MPH from the Religion and Public Health Dual Degree Program at Emory University in 2019. We welcome Tyler as he presents his paper, Social Distancing During the Last Supper, Catholic Emotions, Sacramental Adaptation, and Authority During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Tyler. Uh, thank you for having me. Let me just uh, pull up my slideshow real quick. Uh, it looks like the screen sharing is disabled real quick. You should have access to that now. There we go. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I uh, think so. So um, in March 2020, some countries and US states issued stay at home orders in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which required religious organizations to cease in-person events, including worship services and administration of the sacraments. Catholics across the globe have responded in a variety of ways. Pope Francis has urged the Italian government to open churches and also urged churches to follow governmental protocols. Cardinal Raymond Burke suggested that receiving the Eucharist at Mass is as essential to Catholic lives as food and water. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops acknowledged that the traditional Catholic obligation to attend Mass each Sunday is waived for those who are sick and that this can apply to whole communities in times of need. Additionally, the conference and some dioceses have endorsed spiritual communion for those who are not able to attend Mass in person. With this variety, of responses across the church hierarchy, I came to question what have been Catholics' experiences engaging in digital sacraments? <clears throat> One key question in the study of digital ritual is, are online rituals real religious rituals? Sociologist of religion, Christopher Helland, identifies authority and adaptation as important constructs when seeking to answer how religious communities define if digital rituals are authentic. He notes that in hierarchical traditions, a small group of people may have the authority to determine if a ritual is authentic or not, at least dogmatically. Yet as shifts to the study of lived religion have shown, the laity can sometimes hold religious practices that are not officially sanctioned by the hierarchy. This may be the case with some digital ritual where groups of people can come together virtually and define a ritual as authentic among themselves. Helen also identifies adaptation as an important component contextualizing if groups understand ritual to be authentic. 
He identifies adaptations that transform, invent, or exclude ritual components as important in understanding if groups define a virtual ritual as authentic. Helen concludes, quote, online ritual is not representative of some form of extraordinary activity. Rather, it shows ordinary religious engagement in an extraordinary environment, end quote. <laughs> this understanding makes his approach useful in studying virtual engagement in the mass during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is surely an environment out of the ordinary. I conducted a scoping review of US and Catholic Roman or US and Canadian Roman Catholics experiences the Eucharist during the COVID-19 pandemic, utilizing the database for ProQuest news and newspapers and to collect articles written between February and May 2020. Across 13 articles, I identified six writers who authored the articles and 12 speakers who were quoted in an article but were not the author of the article. I coded the articles for emotions, adaptation, authority, and authenticity conducted a thematic analysis and stratified by the emotions code. My analysis showed a range of emotions described in relation to Catholic people's experiences of being unable to receive the Eucharist during the COVID-19 pandemic. Speakers and writers described a variety of negative emotions, including pain and heartache at being distant from the material Eucharist and anxiety, which appeared to have roots in the COVID-19 pandemic and also be perpetuated by being distant from the sacraments. Positive emotions were experienced by when speakers or writers were able to experience a connection with others while massing, watching mass virtually. Finally, some speakers described a longing emotion, which recognized the hardships people were experiencing and also looked towards a more positive future. Negative emotions of the Eucharist were never cross-coded with it being seen as fully authentic. Father Scott Holmer placed an emphasis on Jesus' presence in the community through the material Eucharist describing the inability to receive the Eucharist from priests or bishops as a heartache. He said, and I quote, I can't absolve people during penance over the phone or through Zoom or over Skype. Jesus would have stayed up in heaven and just made some phone calls. To be with us, to dwell with us is the reason he ordained bishops and they ordained priests. It's the reason he gave us his body and blood in the Eucharist so he could be with us. If we can't do that, it's a big ache. It's a big ache on the heart, end quote. Bishop William McGratton, shared a letter with his diocese describing the importance of the Eucharist stating, quote, I acknowledge the pain that many of the faithful have expressed in their experience of being deprived of the Eucharist, which is so central to our lives as Catholics, end quote. Additionally, layperson Cecilia Benitez Aldera described why she attended in-person mass by saying that she needed to be there in person to, quote, reflect and worship, end quote, before she had the difficult week. A commonality between these descriptions is that none mention the possibility of spiritual communion and focus on being present in church with the material Eucharist. Inversely, the one description that was coded as partially authentic and acknowledged spiritual communion as a partially authentic <coughs> part of digitally mediated Eucharist. While thinking about digital mass services, Professor Randy Boyagoda placed emphasis on the material Eucharist for a fully authentic Eucharistic experience when he wrote about missing the quote, radical substance of the communion wafer, end quote. Yet he also wrote about being able to, quote, continue in the universal life of the church, end quote. Varying from the descriptions above, Professor Boyagoda appears to mark a difference between communion with Jesus through the Eucharist and a broader form of communion that allows for participation in the church. In this way, he is displaying a more nuanced understanding of the multidimensionality of participating in Catholic life, where he includes connections with others even a spiritual communion as part of the Eucharist. <laughs> Inversely from negative emotions, which were never cross-coded cross -coded with full authenticity, no descriptions of positive emotions were cross-coded with inauthenticity. Additionally, no descriptions of positive emotions were cross-coded with exclusionary adaptations. Finally, descriptions of positive emotions came from the laity and did not invoke church authority. As noted above, Professor Boyagoda wrote a particularly nuanced piece and displayed a range of emotions. One place he focuses on a positive emotion in his article is when he shared, quote, granted, it's an amazing sign of worldwide Catholic fellowship and the connective powers of technology when, as my family recently did, you can stream a Sunday mass celebrated in, say, a tiny chapel in Minnesota with the comment bar on the side of the screen not only counting the hundreds and thousands joining the feed, but also allowing them to post greetings and words of encouragement alongside enthusiastic emoji-filled announcements of the coordinates, Mumbai, Melbourne, Mississauga, end quote. As referenced above, he shows some of 
some sense of virtual mass as being partially authentic because connection with uh, between people could be fostered, even if connection with Jesus through the material Eucharist could not be established. Finally, one unique case that emerged is of Dave Manzo and his wife, who blessed bread and wine at home while watching a video stream mass from their church. Mr. Manzo described the practice saying, quote, I know this isn't Catholic teaching, but for us, it's fully authentic. To me, it seems natural. There's no hesitation at all. Jesus would say, feed my people, end quote. In celebrating the Eucharist at home, the Manzos have inventively adapted the Eucharistic ritual by introducing two new elements. First, lay people can perform the ritual in times of need. And second, Mrs. Manzo, a woman can perform the ritual in times of need. The Manzos do, uh, do not invoke or embody any religious authority and in fact acknowledge that their practice goes against what is seen as authentic by those in the church hierarchy. <clears throat> Longing emotions inductively emerged in this analysis, being defined by an acknowledgement that the current situation is difficult and at times painful, while also looking forward to the future when participation in the Eucharist can be fully authentic again. One person who demonstrated the complicated nature of longing uh, through relating it to the Catholic liturgical season of Lent was Father James Hughes, who acknowledged pain in the world, particularly the suffering and death that communities are facing due to the COVID-19 pandemic, theologically linking it to the suffering that Jesus experienced in the world. The article that Father Hughes spoke in was published on April 11th, 2020, the day after Catholics recognize Good Friday and commemorate the death of Jesus. Father Hughes acknowledges this and links it to the pandemic by saying, quote, the profound meaning for Christians of this weekend has not changed. We can't be drawn into hopelessness. We can't be, we are called to be sorrowful because of the current situation, but not sad, end quote. In this, he describes the trajectory from sorrow that Christians are called to feel the death of Jesus to the hope for Jesus' resurrection on Easter Sunday and parallels it with current feelings of sorrow due to the COVID-19 pandemic and calls for Christians to remain hopeful to be reunited with Jesus in the material Eucharist again. Interpreted this way, Father Hughes' comments also suggest that Catholics feel like Jesus is not with them, like Jesus is not physically with his disciples between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. This interpretation is strengthened by his comments that come early in the article. And he says, quote, the, right, the author says, quote, Father Hughes says the virus has jolted Christians as well as everyone else out of their routines, including sacred ones such as mass. It's a great theological conundrum. Members will be in a stance of longing, his hope for the faithful is that they will yearn more than ever for physical communion with the holy through the wine and wafer. Absence may make the heart grow fonder. Father Hughes is not alone in his desire for Catholics to grow in their desire for the Eucharist during times of necessi necessitated distancing from it. The concept of the Eucharistic fast was also present presented by Father Corey Bassett Turrell, who introduced it saying, quote, when the Lenten fast came upon us on Ash Wednesday in February, we had no idea that in two or three weeks time we'd be in a Eucharistic fast as well, end quote. While he conducts live stream masses, he does not see these as a substitute for in-person participation in the Eucharist. He continued, quote, but I see this as a great opportunity, though a difficult one. So my hope and prayer is that, will people, is that people will come back to the altar at a time when it's safe again and have a deeper understanding of what it is that we are receiving, end quote. In his embodied authority as a priest, Father Bassett Tyrell has defined live stream mass as an inauthentic form of Eucharistic ritual for those watching it because it, <clears throat> because it excludes the physical and material elements of the ritual. Yet he has also shifted the frame by drawing on another Catholic practice, Lenten fasting, to reframe this inability for lay Catholics to participate in the Eucharist. He was able to keep the Eucharist centered within Catholic life while also acknowledging that reception of it at this time is not possible. In this analysis, I centered descriptions of emotional experiences while examining Catholic experiences of the sacraments during the COVID-19 pandemic and suggest that emotion is an important theoretical construct to consider in relation to authority and adaptation. Negative, positive, and longing emotions intersect with Helen's theoretical constructs, although it is unclear exactly how emotion interacts with authenticity, if emotions inform authenticity or if authenticity informs emotions. The emergence of the longing emotion was pr particularly illuminating in this analysis and may suggest that some Catholics are not able to fully access collective ritual memories, which Helen suggests, quote, ground people's behavior and orients them towards the sacredness of the events occurring, end quote. 
Further qualitative research that asks specifically about memory and emotions may be able to more fully elucidate the roles that these play and how they interact with authority and adaptation when individuals and communities determine the authenticity of virtual religious rituals. I began this paper thinking about Catholic experiences and responses to stay-at-home orders, but I want to end by connecting these findings and discussion to public health. As I cross boundaries between religious studies and public health practice, I see this research illuminating and contextualizing some of the disagreements we are seeing about church closures, including the recent Supreme Court case concerning the Catholic Diocese in New York. As I reflect on these disagreements, I feel a connection to Robert Orsi and that I'm no longer inside the church enough to make theological and normative pronouncements about what should happen, but I'm not so far outside the church that I can dismiss Catholic experiences which is why I see this research as an important for public health professionals, because it suggests that not all Catholics are able to participate and experience essential religious practices digitally. While some Catholics may be able to authentically participate in the Eucharist digitally while social distancing at their homes, others cannot. This study also suggests that working with priests to reframe social distancing as a Lenten Eucharistic fast may be a feasible and respectful way to mitigate risk for Catholics who cannot fully or cannot authentically participate in the Eucharist digitally, while also recognizing that these Catholics are missing an essential part of their religious life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler. And thanks to uh, all of our presenters this morning. Uh, I'll now turn it over to uh, Father John Baldwin for his uh, response. Father Baldwin. Thanks, uh, Zach. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to you and to Mark Bassett, the director of the center, and especially to you for the uh, terrific organization you've made for this, uh, con this uh, virtual conference. Um, I'm going to respond to the papers in order and uh, then make a couple of uh, general comments. Um, and hopefully there'll be some time for uh, question and answer because I'm sure that these uh, provocative uh, papers have uh, stirred some real questions and comments uh, among the others who have been uh, participating in this session. Um, I have to admit that um, I have been loath to make uh, too many comments about the current situation because uh, I think it needs so much digestion and I think it's going to take us a long time to uh, figure all this out. Um, when I'm asked, uh, I've been asked in a couple of interviews, um, I haven't written anything on my own initiative, but I've been asked in a couple of interviews um, to address the situation. And uh, the first thing I always say is I have no answers. So uh, let me let me begin by saying that. Um, first, first, before I go into Deborah Wong's uh, paper, let me make another general comment. Um, the variety of approaches, and there's a rich variety of approaches, of course, in these four presentations, I think shows that uh, how for Catholics, uh, liturgy, and especially the Eucharist, has become a, a major issue right now. Uh, this is not exclusive to uh, Catholics. Uh, I know many Lutherans and, and uh, Episcopalians for, for whom it's as, uh, in ways uh, as press, pressing an issue, but it's, it's particularly important, I think, for Roman Catholics. Um, I also note that uh, if you look at the other papers that have been uh, proposed that have been give, given in this uh, conference, um, there are a number of other papers that deal one way or another with worship and liturgy. So obviously worship is an, a, an extremely important aspect of this, uh, of this uh, discussion of the pandemic, uh, one that would take more than just our session. Okay, let me turn to, I'm gonna do a comment on each of uh, the papers, your papers um, in order, in the order that, uh, you presented them, and then uh, I'll end up with a couple of other comments. Um, I uh, very much appreciate uh, the uh, cleverness of uh, Deborah's uh, uh, introduction uh, with the Sherlock Holmes and the, uh, the image of the, the fire uh, concentrating our attention. Um, and that's a good question. How has the pandemic inspired us to some different ways of thinking about the liturgy? Right? So, so it, it's, an, it, it's alerted us to, to, to what's important, but it's also inspired us to different ways of thinking about the liturgy. Um, 
I think that she uh, exposes, I like that, the, the fact that she exposes the fact that ordained ministries see their work as primarily event-based. Um, and uh, the, of course, the, the problem that this may not work in a networking, so-called networking uh, society. Uh, putting our money on live liturgies, and this is going to be a theme that's repeated, eh? Uh, certainly seems to make sense. But we have to consider the, uh, the fact that uh, church attendance did begin to plummet well before the pandemic. It's just, it's not just a reaction uh, to the pandemic. Um, so we have to be wary right now about generalizing too much. Um, recently, I've been reading the book by Stephen Bullivant, sociologist called Mass Exodus, uh, which uh, deals with the, uh, uh, the, the loss of church attendance among Roman Catholics. Uh, long, of course, written before the pandemic. Um, so my guess, actually, is that anonymity and a lack of sense of connection in many ur urban and, and also large suburban parishes already paved the way for people to be comfortable with alternative ways of worshiping. Um, part of that is because the Roman Catholic liturgical reform has not uh, been as successful uh, as might have been hoped, but that would take me onto a long uh, uh, excursus, and I won't, uh, I won't go there. I am sympathetic to Wong's uh, basic uh, argument that, quote, I'll quote her, what is needed is not a decentering of the worship event from the church community, but rather a reclaiming of the event more fully as one that is con concerned with creating and sustaining a community that is both local and global both situated and dispersed, both gathered and, and I think I would emphasize this word sent. Uh, I, think that, I think that is a very solid argument. Um, the major insight that can be developed uh, even further uh, is that uh, the event of liturgy, that is to say Sunday mass in person, let's say, is not enough to sustain a lively religious faith that is more than what uh, Robert Bella and his companions called, uh, she, famously called Sheilaism, you know, in Habits of the Heart. Um, I think there are lots of alternatives out there that are, are already, have already been practicing. Um, the paper made me think of Robert Wuthnow's 1994 book, Sharing the Journey, which holds up the 12-step process as a model for connecting. Um, as you know, with now a, a sociologist of religion. Uh, I also want to flag uh, Deborah's use of the um, of uh, Paul Homer's liturgical hyper consciousness. I think uh, that that figures in this whole question of of whether the liturgy is enough, and um, certainly that's very much of my own uh, approach to liturgy that. Uh, to stop with the liturgy is to make a huge mix, mistake. Uh, Deborah's intuition that finding God in the everyday is important for a more robust engagement with religious faith is an important, uh, I think, an important uh, intuition here. Um, I, if I, if I may be uh, permitted to be uh, to be personal, uh, this uh, is very much in line with. Uh, Jesuit or Ignatian spirituality of finding God in all things. Uh, so let's enter into the deeper theological question, though, that she raises and is, comes up in other ways in some of the other presentations. Uh, are informal gatherings like Theology on Tap, very popular, um, sufficient? Uh, and I think here, as she quotes uh, my, my own uh, supervisor, Aidan Cavanaugh, uh, and uh, his student, uh, David Fagerberg, uh, pretty well, uh, that liturgy is God's act first, right? The church is technically an ecclesia, a, a convocation, a calling together by God, that God is the primary actor. Uh, and I think that's a very deep Catholic uh, affirmation or principle. Uh, and a major part of that ecclesia is sacramentality, the physical. Uh, once again, we re will revisit this. An issue uh, which uh, several, several of you took up. Um, on this, uh, as a side uh, comment, let me recommend here an online piece uh, 
uh, in America media, uh, the Jesuit uh, uh, magazine, uh, et cetera, by a Jesuit named Anthony Luzvardi on not broadcasting Sunday mass um, in terms of that sacramentality. Um, we got a lot of responses. I very much agree with uh, Deborah's emphasis on the missa uh, or the sending aspect of the uh, liturgical event, sending out, which I think has been very underdeveloped in Catholic and other mainline liturgical traditions. Uh, she's right that uh, the current homebound, if we could call it, situation only exacerbates this uh, difficulty. And I'll come back in my general comments to this. Now, how one can remedy the situation is a very good question, uh, which of course, uh, Deborah leaves largely un unanswered. But that, her conclusion, that this is a major task, uh, helps us to recognize our uh, present situation very well. So thank you, thank you, Deborah. Let me turn to uh, Edmund uh, Lazari's uh, presentation. Um, of course, Edmund takes a, a much, obviously a much more uh, theological or directly theological approach, uh, em employing very tried and true uh, Catholic uh, traditional formulations uh, to deal with this whole question of uh, virtual uh, Catholicism. Of course, as he says, one can't gainsay the fact that God can engage us in whatever way God wills to engage us. Uh, that grace is everywhere, the theology of the great Jesuit theologian Karl Rahner, and that desire uh, for baptism, forgiveness, spiritual communion is maintained uh, in Catholic teaching. Now, that's quite clear. Uh, and, and as he rightly uh, comments, and uh, which he eschews, huh? Uh, this kind of thinking leads to a kind of minimalism, right? Uh, as uh, the question that comes up so often with my own uh, students in liturgy and sacramental theology, uh, where they always want to default to validity, which I claim is the least interesting issue in sacramental theology, uh, much to their chagrin. Uh, for Edmund, the, uh, the key is uh, going beyond min minimalism. And the key to that is embodiment. And I think that is, of course, right on target. Uh, um, embodiment on the, on the basis of the incarnation right, of, the, of the second person of the Blessed Trinity is the heart of the Catholic sacramental genius. It is the foundation of the, of the Catholic sacramental principle. Whether the flourishing which is characterized by virtuous living can do without sacramental embodiment is a very good question. And uh, I think uh, the, uh, the, the direction that uh, Edmund takes is, is a correct one, that the answer to that is no. Interestingly enough, uh, you can take a look at uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, of course, dealt with uh, some of this, especially in his question on communion in the third part of his Summa, question 80, where he talks about the um, the fact that one can be engaged in spiritual communion and achieve the goal of the sacrament of the, the Eucharist or its, uh, its res, uh, its uh, uh, union in and with Christ, um, but that the fullest way of participating is the sacramental. And of course, he has chose earlier on in the Summa, as uh, Edmund quotes in question 60 and following, uh, why that uh, sacramental embodiment is important. I, I like uh, Edmund's uh, uh, playful take on the two meanings of virtual. And I think uh, that take is rather helpful. Uh, I agree that uh, his conclusion that virtual participation leaves a lot to be desired. There's been so much uh, controversy and debate about this in lots of the literature. Um, if one has access to La Croix International, uh, there's a very inter interesting debate between two uh, priests, Father Grayland of New Zealand and Father Eust of uh, uh, California. I also think that uh, Lazari's expansion of his argument using the phenomenological analysis of Robert Sokolowski and uh, also of uh, uh, John Paul II's Theology of the Body is very helpful in making uh, his case for lit liturgy's fundamental engagement of all the senses uh, even the rustling of children in churches, as you mentioned. 
In my opinion, uh, your insistence that only live worship fully engages the human being in the communal nature of Christian belief and living is right on target. Uh, incorporation, literally incorporation, is just the right word. Um, as the Scottish philosopher John McMurray uh, put it so well, we only become persons in relation. And that relation ultimately requires some kind of bodily engagement. Um, as I come to the end, I'd also like to flag the important point uh, that uh, Edmund makes with regard to the eschatological dimension of what it means to be a flourishing church, something that we neglect, have neglected uh, for an awful long time and is only being recovered, or I'd say in the last 70 years or so in Catholic theology or Christian sacramental theology in general. Um, after all, we insist on the resurrection of the body. Uh, the bottom line um, for him, and I think is, uh, I have to agree, our present situation is only a temporary uh, solution for Catholics. Um, virtual liturgy is, or perhaps should be ultimately, unsatisfying and insufficient. Uh, so thank you, Edmund. Uh, Dominic uh, Pinieri, let me turn to your uh, paper, your presentation, uh, mainly uh, here in this uh, follows uh, very nicely from the previous ones. Uh, it's about the suspension of the Eucharist in person and what you call their clericalism, uh, which raises a host of interesting uh, issues uh, for me. Uh, and once again, I'm ten tempted to give too long a, an excursus and give my own talk instead of responding to yours. Of course, that's a perennial temptation of respondents. Um, um, for a number of people, right, the, the response is, as a number of people that you quote, uh, like uh, Dr. Stefanik, uh, mass is necessary and they're taking it away from us. That's, a, that's a, to, to leap to the next paper, a very emotional response as well. Huh? Uh, people can ask, why are liquor stores deemed essential uh, and yet church services not, right? Um, and that's a very good question. Uh, I'd add by way of uh, parenthesis that in South Africa, uh, they closed down liquor stores for months, um, uh, deemed not essential. Uh, grocery stores, of course, we could all agree are essential. Um, Dominic takes an interesting approach with regard to uh, to uh, uh, clericalism uh, and uh, quoting him, uh, Dr. Stefanik puts it well saying the bishop's solution to the coronavirus was private mass, masses by the priests and internet streaming for everyone else. But this gives rise to clericalism isn't the call to holiness universal. And it also gives rise to confusion. Uh, Clericalism refers to giving spiritual superiority to the clergy, treating the laity as being of lesser value in a Catholic view. And of course, as our current Pope uh, Francis uh, has uh, emphasized so much, it really is a blot on the church, uh, clericalism. Um, but uh, of course, the bishop's solution uh, may be problematic in other ways. And uh, here, I, uh, here I add uh, my own... Uh, uh, my own uh, theological opinion, uh, saying ma mass uh, privately. Uh, so a priest, uh, for example, in a church with a, an iPad in front of him, as I've seen in many places, uh, many examples, of uh, doing a so-called private mass is very problematic. Uh, for me, reading the New Testament, it's very difficult to understand how that has any continuity uh, with the institution of the Eucharist. Um, and I regard private mass, just to be provocative, uh, as an anomaly, if not an abuse. Uh, end of that parenthesis. Uh, next, let me be even more uh, provocative, uh, since your, your uh, paper raises some provocative questions for me. Uh, isn't, perhaps the solution is to fast from the Eucharist period, not only laity, but also clergy. Now, I know that that is a radical solution. Um, but I think, for example, about Catholics in Korea who had been evangelized and who had no priests for some uh, decades in the 18th century, and yet who maintained their Catholic faith, 
no doubt with great and deep longing for the sacramental life and especially for the Eucharist, no doubt about that. Uh, but sometimes fasting from the Eucharist uh, period uh, may, be, uh, may be necessary or advisable. Or think about the reaction, I haven't investigated this uh, sufficiently myself, but uh, the reaction to the flu epidemic of 1918, uh, which was very similar in terms of ga people gathering uh, to our own situation. Um, I like very much, I think uh, you're right on target with your appeal to uh, Lumen Gentium 31 and 34 about the importance of lay participation in the uh, Eucharist, in the liturgy, and, uh, and, and specifically Lumen Gentium 11 about uh, lay, uh, the laity offering together with the priest, which is, a, uh, I think, a very fruitful uh, path for, uh, for more theological reflection today. Um, and I think we, we don't yet understand exactly what that means or haven't appreciated exactly what that means. Because I don't think you quote uh, the Liturgy Constitution at number 14, which talks about participation being the right of the laity on the basis of our baptism. It's, the participation in the liturgy is not a, a concession on the part of the hierarchical church. It is part and parcel a right of our of us as the baptized people of God uh, on the basis of that very baptism. Um, your conclusion, uh, Dominic's conclusion is that the decision of the bishops, quote, to suspend the obligation for the laity to attend mass is understandable. But what goes too far is the barring of the laity from, ma from mass by suspending its public celebration. Um, and then you raise a very interesting and I think somewhat provocative question and one that merits an awful lot of discussion more than I can give it right now. Are spiritual priorities secondary to physical health? Uh, and that's a question worth pursuing a lot further, I think. Um, I don't think that ultimately anybody would want to say yes, that they're secondary, but I think we have it. The answer to it is also very complex. Uh, I mean, I have been reminded from the very beginning of the pandemic that sometimes our panic um, blinds us to the fact that, after all, we do believe in eternal life. Uh, but at the same time, it, it, we obviously have an obligation to care for our physical well-being, a moral obligation. Um, I'd have to conclude, I'd say with the majority of the bishops, that as long as there is serious likelihood of coronavirus transmission, of course, that's the that's the key, isn't it? Serious likelihood. Churches should limit attendance. Uh, in my ex pastoral experience, I'll come back to this. Uh, this has been accepted by the vast majority of Catholics. Finally, uh, finally, in terms of the presentation, let me turn to uh, Tyler Fuller's uh, presentation uh, that deals with a variety of Catholic experiences in, ga in engaging uh, sacraments di digitally. Um, uh, using a number of authors that I have not uh, uh, been acquainted with, and so in some ways I'm uh, I'm uh, flying uh, by the seat of my pants. Uh, uh, for example, Christopher Helland in exploring the creative means by which uh, used by Catholics to perpetuate uh, to participate in in rituals. I'm going to come back to that in my general comments. Uh, one thing I would I thought of as I was reading the paper was a, a fine book by Teresa Teresa Berger. Of Yale, um, and very timely, uh, 2019, uh, published just before the, the uh, pandemic, uh, At Worship, Liturgical Practices in Digital Worlds. And it's a very balanced uh, book, which I, uh, which I highly recommend. Uh, his method uh, that you coded the articles for uh, uh, emotions, adaptation, authority, and authenticity, and then conducted a thematic analysis stratifying by the emotions code. Uh, I confess, um, I have to confess some ignorance as to the methodology of, uh, of uh, that you're using and uh, stratify, especially stratifying by the emotions code, uh, but it looked, uh, it looked very, like a very fruitful path to me and I'd like to, uh, to learn more about it, honestly. Uh, these things being said, 
uh, here, there are a lot of, uh, clearly a lot of negative emotions surrounding being deprived of physical engagement in the Eucharist, uh, especially in those words like longing and heartache. Uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by the use of uh, the comments bar online in online liturgies. I've seen that. Um, and by how a relatively obscure chapel, huh, like uh, uh, the one mentioned by Poya Garda uh, in Minnesota can attract thousands of viewers uh, from around the world. That is, uh, that is a fascinating development. And one, another one that uh, merits a lot more uh, uh, thought. Um, I, applaud, I, I applaud your modesty more and more uh, as a theologian. I think modesty is a word uh, that we need to explore a lot more. Uh, when you say it is unclear exactly how emotions interact with other constructs. Uh, I think when we were dealing with the mystery of God in relationship to humanity, that uh, uh, perhaps we forget very often modesty in our legitimate desire uh, for understanding. Um, it's a good question that's uh, raised, I think, uh, by this, uh, and I'll bring, come back to it in the general comments. Does absence make the heart grow fonder? Is that what's happening in the current situation? Uh, are people who might not otherwise have been so uh, eager to uh, be participating, uh, uh, engaged uh, bodily in church, has that made them appreciate the uh, importance of, of coming together? Um, I applaud um, Tyler's attention to the public health consequences of this crisis in the sense that we're, we're dealing with more than physical health. Uh, when it comes to the longing that many Catholics have for the Eucharist right now. So thank you, uh, Tyler, as well. Let me uh, turn then to a, to a number of larger issues. Um, I know I'm not supposed to be giving my own paper, but I think I have nine of them uh, quickly uh, that these uh, papers raised for me. Um, so I'll try to go through them quickly so that we have some time for, for question and answer. Um, one, one issue that's raised for me is how can we capitalize on the silver lining, as I see it, of lay persons taking some responsibility for their worship lives. Um, one of the parishes that I serve, you know, pastorally on Sundays, uh, the people have in some ways an, uh, developed an alternative uh, worship service, word service on Sunday mornings, which is very robust. And of course, because it's not uh, uh, clerically sanctioned, uh, et cetera, um, can have lay preachers and things like that, things like that, uh, or a group here, even here at the uh, School of Theology and Ministry uh, that started last year at the beginning of the uh, pandemic uh, that holds uh, frequent services. I attended one uh, that I found extremely moving and online uh, uh, stations of the cross on Good Friday. Second, I think there's a lot of good news here uh, uh, in that so many people have articulated a hunger uh, for worshiping in person. And I think uh, the comment about uh, Father Hughes is on target there. Um, there's, a, there's another, thirdly, there's another curious silver lining uh, in that groups of friends and families can be united by, and I put this in quotes, participation in online liturgies uh, that they share. Uh, so uh, I've heard people say, uh, what did you think of the homily at that uh, University of Notre Dame liturgy yesterday? Um, or the, the uh, to go back to the Minnesota chapel, uh, comments, emojis, et cetera, on the, on the side of the screen. Uh, but uh, some people share in the liturgy in a way that they have uh, never been able to share before. For, on the other hand, right, there is considerable confusion with regard to how to participate in the Sunday Eucharist. Uh, for example, an ex-priest who called me and said, uh, would it be okay if, given the pandemic, if he celebrated the Eucharist at home with his wife? Uh, I, uh, given the fact that I think a, a priest cannot celebrate outside of the context of uh, the direct, uh, his direct entitlement by the church, given a title by the church, my answer was no. Uh, or putting out bread and wine to have them consecrated, uh, quote unquote, consecrated uh, remotely. Uh, which uh, Tyler uh, raised and is, uh, I think, 
in terms of Catholic sacramentality, not possible. It may be possible in terms of people's spiritual nourishment, but in terms of uh, it actually in the sacramental sense being the body and blood of Christ is not allowed. The Lutherans, interestingly enough, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I raised the very same question and gave the same sacramental answer that I gave. Uh, five, in some ways, whether or not to have live services uh, in person, or the, the question raised about live, well, live services and the right to live services by Dominic um, is not a new one. It's, uh, it's not a new one. Um, let me suggest to you another book, uh, Carlo Cipolla's instructive book, Faith, Reason, and the Plague in 17th Century Tuscany, where at the beginnings of understanding public health, you have great conflict be between a more traditional approach uh, that emphasized things like processions in the streets, of course, which spread the plague, right? Uh, and um, and uh, refraining from uh, those kinds of religious practices. Um, also raised that it's very interesting uh, how, how there have been very creative reactions to all these things. For example, in the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic, uh, where the Protestants, I think this is the initiation of individual communion, communion cups because of the spread of a uh, of virus uh, by among Protestants. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'd say, I don't mean to be mean, but uh, unfortunately that uh, practice did not go away. Six, even in live, live worship, right, even in normal, quote unquote, normal times, have we learned in uh, our reformed rites in Roman Catholicism to let our symbols and rituals appear or appear fully? Uh, and there's always the question that was raised by Romano Guardini uh, in the 1960s, are modern human beings capable of liturgy? Liturgy fehig. Seven, uh, and here's a, a cynical question. Will anyone besides the diehards come back? Uh, is this crisis yet uh, another nail in the coffin for Catholics, uh, particularly I would say progressive Catholics? I have to say in my pastoral experience uh, over the last number of months when we returned to live mass, albeit limited, a very few people have been participating on Sundays. Uh, there's a great deal of fear and it's a warranted fear. Eight, um, I think we have to keep on saying under normal circumstances when we talk about the rights of Catholics. Um, for example, has been proposed a number of times that uh, in canon law, communion on the tongue is a, uh, is a right that Catholics have. Absolutely true, it is a right that Catholics have, but I would always add under normal circumstances. Uh, to which, please God, we may return before long. So ninth comment, general comment is, uh, I really enjoyed your papers uh, and I appreciate it. Uh, as you can tell from all of these uh, reactions that I've had, um, uh, I appreciated the number of questions, provocative questions and insights uh, into the issues uh, that you've raised. Uh, obviously issues that uh, as uh, religious folk, uh, many of us feel very, very deep in the bone. So once again, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Father Baldwin. We'll now um, open the floor for questions from, uh, from anyone actually. Uh, we have about uh, seven minutes before our session ends so that will facilitate some questions if you have questions for the presenters. Um, and also, uh, should the presenters want to engage with Father Baldwin a little further based on his response, I'll invite that as well. So please use the raise hand function. Um, if you would, and uh, or type your question in the chat. So I'll open the floor. And I can also ask the first question as well. So, um, uh, I have a question. This goes to Edmund's. This this is a combination based on a response to Edmund's paper and to, and to Edmund. I'm wondering. Um, I'm not. I'm not terribly well versed in questions of of um, uh, uh, theologies of disability, and I'm wondering if the if the uh, comments made by Father Bolivan regarding um, the role of in person liturgy being 
uh, a question of incorporation about community, some form of embodiment in a community, sort of, it seemed, it seemed based on my interpretation and accentuation of that component, the communal component, as opposed to sort of sensory elements. If that, um, if that provides some uh, differentiation between what we would consider uh, 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 the fullness of participation as opposed to the acknowledgement that folks with disabilities are also fully participating uh, without, the, without any sort of um, truncated experience of, of the grace that's afforded to them by participation in, in uh, uh, the ritual life of the church. Um, that's sort of an open question, mostly because I'm not as familiar with that body of theology, but I'll, I'll sort of leave it there. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question that I haven't uh, really connected with liturgical theology before, so thank you for raising it. Um, I think the, it's really important to note the, the twofold participation in the liturgy, uh, the, the internal and the external. Uh, so here I really focused on the, the objective bodily because it impacts the, the subjective as well. I was sort of giving a blank, uh, giving blank check to assuming everybody is internally participating as well as they can. Um, but on the external side, uh, uh, except for people who um, probably can't, you know, speak uh, or things, there are uh, there's probably not a lot of uh, of disability in the role of the laity in the church. There are many different grades of uh, of ways that lay people participate in the mass for instance. Um, but a lot of the other, all of the other sacraments are also liturgical, uh, liturgical ceremonies. There are some liturgies that are not sacraments, like the liturgy of the hours. Um, so there is like just being, being physically there uh, is something that is available basically to everybody, but uh, hospital and homebound people, which the Catholic Church has tried for a long time to have streamed liturgies. For them, but uh, I also want to make make a distinction here. In the moral life, it is morally relevant the difference between the minimum and flourishing. But in a lot of other areas of Catholic theology, while this different twofold approach is applicable, it's not necessarily morally relevant. So I think in in a liturgy, if you're really having a flourishing liturgy, there should be sacred music, at least chant hopefully polyphony, as much as sung as possible, as the documents of the church direct. But that doesn't mean a liturgy without such music is sort of morally lesser or lesser worship. We can accurately describe it as flourishing less, objectively speaking. Uh, so that's that's not to be a, a moral, um, a moral condemnation or saying that a person or a church is lesser than uh, something for not as uh, per, not uh, participating in a flourishing manner or as flourishing as not. Thank you, Edmund. Dominic. Uh, hi, I had a question for uh, Father Baldwin um, because uh, basically my question is this: uh, I'm just not familiar with this and so I wanted to ask if you knew of any is there any spiritual tradition um, especially within Catholicism that incorporates a fasting from the Eucharist um, of course there's a Eucharistic fast for fasting from food before the Eucharist but if there are spiritual traditions that see it as beneficial to at times abstain from mass and or the Eucharist uh, good. That's a very good question. Uh, the answer is yes, kind of. <laughs> um, the uh, We fast from the Eucharist on Good Friday and on uh, Holy Saturday, for example, uh, for good reason, I think. Uh, going beyond the Western tradition, because the church breathes with two lungs, as John Paul II uh, used to like to say, um, the uh, the our, the Eastern traditions uh, do not have daily Eucharist, uh, right? They their their tradition is to either fast or feast, 
Um, so uh, on, on days of fast, they don't celebrate the Eucharist. Though during Lent, they can have communion of what's called the pre-sanctified. Of course, I was making an even stronger point uh, about that. I could, I suppose you could talk about the uh, question of interdict in the, uh, the Middle Ages. Now, were priests forbidden to celebrate the mass during interdict? That I don't know. So I, I, I can't tell you for sure. Um, but, but it seems to me that that uh, increasing the longing for the Eucharist, uh, which I think we so often take for granted, is not a terrible idea, but not a great answer. Thank you. We're almost at time. If I might ask one additional question, uh, just for the for the sake of a couple more voices, this question is for both Tyler and for Debbie. Um, with regard to the practices that have emerged, you know, Debbie, you, you were speaking of a number of practices that have sort of uh, supplanted our normal worship style. Tyler, you've you even raised an, um, circumstances in which, for example, women were were uh, celebrating some form of, of, uh, of, a, of a liturgical ritual uh, at home. I'm wondering what your, what your best guess would be with regard to how that might influence what church looks like post pandemic, if, if we'll sort of just clamp that stuff down again and uh, you know, move back to our, our, our normal routines and status quo, or if you think there's opportunities for development there. And the reason I asked that question has to do with uh, the recent uh, discussions of uh, women deacons, the Amazonian Synod, you know, what's actually happening on the ground and how that might influence the practice, for example, of the Roman Catholic uh, tradition. So if you have any thoughts or speculations on it, I'd be, I'd be interested in hearing that. Not all at once, of course. Uh, oh. um, I can just toss in my two cents real quick. Um, I mean, I'm not a theologian. My paper is explicitly an anthropology sociology approach. Um, but I think that these kinds of practice, I mean, I was focusing on what are the things the laity are doing um, with or without the authority of the, the, you know, the hierarchy and dogma. And I think that these things are already present in Catholic culture in the laity. I think they're going to continue to be. I don't know that I see that, you know, that example was was an oddity. It was a an outlier, but I think that those are sometimes the most interesting things to consider. Um, so I think they've always been there, always will be. It just depends how much the hierarchy wants to recognize those things as valid expressions of Catholic identity. Yeah, similarly, I mean, I'm, I'm not coming from a Catholic background in the minority here, obviously, but um, I, I want to hope that both will continue, right? And I think just listening to all the papers and the discussion today, I think that seems like the challenge before us is to, in some ways, we, we're, I'm grateful for the sort of minimalist, uh, you know, what's, what's the basic that makes this valid approach, because I think that allows us to acknowledge that we're not left helpless in this situation, but like Father Baldwin said, that's not, and and also um, Edmund, like we don't wanna aim for that, right? Like that that's sort of the foundation, but we should be aiming higher. Um, and I think these so-called alternative practices are just other ways of extending our worship beyond what we do in the gathered event um, are key to that, right? And also the sacrament, right? And so for me, what I was trying to do is to hold to this sort of high sacramentality that I think is very much in line with Catholic spirituality, but is often absent in a lot of other Protestant mainline, especially non-denominational evangelical things, while still wanting to say like, we can have both and we need to have both, I think. So I'm not sure if the trajectory is aimed that way right now, but I think that's would be the goal in my opinion. Thank you both. Edmund, I'll give you the last word, last question. Sorry, I didn't didn't mean to take the last word here, but um, I think uh, there, there's another distinction here of between liturgical prayer and other religious services and prayers. Uh, that liturgical prayer being a public communal service uh, is something that is really indispensable. But if you don't come to it with a subjective disposition ready to, to have a relationship with Christ, uh, 
a lot of the other religious rituals and services and gatherings can really help that. And uh, I think it was Sacrosanto Concilia that said that other religious devotions are essential in breathing life into our public communal prayer. Uh, and so that's why I really like Father Baldwin was saying that, you know, the liturgy is not sufficient. And if you try to make the liturgy the only thing, then it itself is not going to be a lively, active expression of faith. And a lot of the, what we're calling alternative methods, can really light that fire and stoke it to be brought to the liturgy. Thank you. And th thank you all. I'd like to uh, give a special thanks to uh, Debbie and to Edmund and to Dominic and to Tyler and to Father Baldwin for all of their insights and information. We're, we're uh, off to a great start. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you to take a stretch and refill your coffee cups. We, we reconvene for our concurrent paper session two at 11 o'clock to so about 10 minutes. So thanks again all and uh, uh, we appreciate your contributions.